Okay, so this is the, the second lecture for uh, the course on uh, deep learning and uh, neural network. Today, I'm going to start with presenting the foundation of machine learning, and then we will start by considering the case of uh, image classification and what are the challenges and what are the naive solutions that we can use in order to solve the image classification problem. And of course, as long as we move inside uh, in this course, we're going to discuss more advanced concepts until we come to the latest technologies about how we, uh, the latest algorithms or machine learning algorithms for image classification, object detection, and other uh, techniques as well. Okay, so I would like to recommend everyone to, uh, to take the specialization of neural network, uh, deep learning and neural network on course era, if you would like to have, because this course is going to go in parallel with this specialization. So at the end, you will be able to get a certificate just by uh, following this course. And the requirement for this course, of course, there are some videos. I'm going to present the content of most of the videos. And, uh, but also there are some quizzes and uh, other assi programming assignments. So if you do them all and you get 70%, you'll get a certificate for the course. So there are five courses uh, for the specialization. You can take any of the five course or all of them or part of them. So let's get started with the foundation of uh, machine learning. First of all, you need to understand the difference because nowadays we talk about AI, we talk about machine learning, deep learning, and most of people actually confuse uh, among these different uh, keywords. So artificial intelligence is the big umbrella. And this uh, area has started since the 1950s. Okay, so it's very old. And it includes a lot of disciplines, like for example, robotics. It, uh, it includes search algorithms and different other techniques. So at the start of the 80s, we had a new area that is called machine learning, which is a more dedicated and focused area of artificial intelligence. And in, this, uh, in machine learning, we usually need to have data in order to build some models, models that we learn from the data and produce some outputs to the data to make predictions, to make regressions, or different type of outputs. And starting from uh, 2000. 12, 2010, 11. So deep learning becomes actually the keyword, the new keyword or the buzzword, which is a branch of machine learning. So it is machine learning that actually use neural network. Because machine learning, there are different techniques. I'm going to introduce you the main techniques of machine learning. And one of them are neural networks, which you also uses data to learn and then produce output at the end. Okay, so when we talk about deep learning, it's mainly that we are talking about neural tool, which is very specific uh, technique for machine learning. For machine learning, there are, for example, SVM, k-means, clustering, and different other techniques uh, that are also used. So this is the difference between the three areas so that you have clear understanding of them. Now, what's new in machine learning? What is the difference between machine learning and the traditional programming approach. Now, for example, when you have learned in Java programming one, Java programming two, or data structures, what you usually do, you will develop a program, okay? And then you will provide some data to the program, and the program will make some computation and will return you some output. This is the traditional programming strategy, right? But in machine learning, the paradigm is completely different. Okay, it's completely different. We will not have any program. So there is no logical program that, for example, with some if statements or uh, for loops or anything, no. So usually we're going to provide data and the output corresponding to this data. Okay, so we need to have a data set that contains all the data and also the output that is expected from every data. And then we will develop some kind of model that at the end is going to generate the program. So the program is actually the model that will be resulting from what was learned from the data and its output. That's the difference, okay? So uh, for example, uh, if you have, you can use this paradigm, for example, you, you want to predict the price of houses given some characteristic of the house. Okay, for example, you say that I have a house that has, for example, five rooms. It is located in uh, Salahdin district. And you give some characteristics. 
So what, what will be the price for this house? If you use machine learning technique, what we should do? We should take a large number of houses with characteristics, and then we can output them into a certain model. And this model is going to learn okay, from this uh, output, and at the end, it's going to provide you a way such that if you provide the model or the program a new data that was not seen before, it will provide you the predicted label or the predicted output for this data. And machine learning is even like kids are learning. Okay, kids, usually they, have, they will see, for example, the chair several times every time. Like, this is a chair, this is a chair, this is a chair, this is a house, this is a car, and so on. And with the time, they will learn. Okay? In the beginning, if you show uh, him, for example, the chair for the first time, he won't say a chair, maybe he will say something else. But if you repeat this several times, he's going to correct himself until finally he will have the knowledge of it. So this is basically the difference between traditional programming and machine learning. And we cannot do machine learning without data. So data is the most important and the most difficult part when you do machine learning. Well, if you get the data, you have like, uh, let's say, 60 to 70 percent of your work done. Okay, this also shows the uh, difference, another uh, plot that shows the difference. So basically, for traditional programming, you provide data and program, and finally you get an output. And in machine learning, you have data and output, and finally you will develop a program or a model. Now, let's consider a traditional programming approach. Imagine that you have this uh, image, and you, you write a program that classifies the image. Yeah, because now, if you think about this in the traditional approach, you have such an image, and you have mi uh, like thousands or millions of pixels, and how to go using, for example, if statements, while loop, or whatever, to find uh, what is in the image is going to be very, very difficult. Okay, because usually we define a method here, classify image. You want to put an image here, and finally you will write some static code, and at the end you want to return the class name. This approach is not feasible actually when you have a large amount of data. Okay, because every pixel here is going to be a single feature. So you have millions of features. How can I know from these millions of features using some traditional approach, okay, that this is, uh, these are dogs or this is cat? It's pretty much a challenging problem. That's why when you have a lot of data, when you have abundant data, in this case, we change our way of thinking. And we uh, follow a data-driven approach. Okay, now they are more happy. Okay, because they, uh, we can find uh, an easier solution. So here, the idea is to develop a model or to develop a program that can classify images using a data set of images and labels. So we need to have a data set, a certain number of data that contains the data itself plus the label, the, the expected output. And in this case, we will not define one function. We will define two functions. One function that is called train and it will take as argument the images and the labels. And then you will write some machine learning code inside. And finally, it will return what? The program, the model. Now I have a model, OK? I have trained this model. You can imagine this is like a brain, OK? And then I will take this model and will provide the new images haven't seen before. And then I will predict. So you write some, you use the model here. Finally, you will, you will get a label for every test image. Of course, the label may be correct, may not be correct. It's at the end, it's prediction. Everything is probabilistic, okay? And along this course, we are going to learn how we can define training functions and prediction functions, and how we can estimate the error between, uh, okay, the error that is from the model. If for the model, if the model, for example, is able to find 95% uh, of time correct answer, so it's reliable. But for example, if it finds 30% or 20%, so it's, it didn't learn enough, okay, to provide as accurate precisions. And we will see how we can actually develop this kind of algorithms. Okay, before diving deeper into the course, we need also to understand the type of data that we are going to manipulate. Okay, there are different types of data. When we say data, it's very broad, okay? How this data? For example, we can have structured data. And this is the classical data that, for example, we have in databases. In database, you have tables, and every, you have different columns. Every column has different rows, and every row contains values for the data. This is called structured. 
can be displayed in rows and columns. It can have numbers, different types. Okay, you can interpret it easily. This is what we call structured data. But actually in real life, maybe most of the data is not structured. It comes into different other forms. For example, you can have audio. Okay, for, uh, now we have speech recognition. You can talk to your Siri, for example, on iPhone or on your mobile phone, and then it can translate this to a text. So the input here is some kind of random data. How can I interpret this random data in order to generate some output label, for example, converting the audio to a, t to a text? Or we can have images, and here we have pixels. So even the nature of the data will be completely different. Or you can also text. Now, for example, if you go to Amazon or TripAdvisor or whatever, you will find reviews, and you have millions of reviews. So actually, you can use machine learning technique to take what we call sentiment analysis, how people think about a certain hotel in general. Okay? They do this, for example, for analyzing uh, Twitter uh, tweets uh, during elections or during big events, so they can know how people are thinking. They will process huge amount of data, but data here is actually a text. Someone is going to write two words, someone is going to write big paragraph. Uh, some people express themselves in different ways. Okay, they don't use the same words. There are some words that belongs to a slang, not to the, for example, normal English or normal, uh, or, uh, normal language. So all of this has to be taken into account. We cannot process this using if statements or traditional approaches. It's very complex. So that's why different types of machine learning technique are proposed. For example, in images, the typical way is to use convolutional neural network. You will understand what is this. For text and audio, there is recurrent neural network. And for, uh, we can have also pure neural network for structured data. It depends on your data. You will develop a specific model to process that data. Now, when we talk about machine learning, we have two types of learning or two main categories, what we call the supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Okay, so what does it mean supervised and unsupervised? In supervised, we actually do the, have the data and labels. Okay, develop predictive model based on both input and output data. I already have the data and corresponding output. And of course, labeling data, it takes time. Because now, for example, if you take images, they're not labeled. So you have to say, this image corresponds to a cat, this image corresponds to a dog. You have to do the labeling manually, and there is no other way. So it's very tedious, very hard, takes a lot of time. Okay, okay so the students that have participated, for example, in uh, the Pilgrim data set uh, construction, they spend a lot of time to build. So that's why, because of uh, it's not always possible to get enough data that is labeled. And now some jobs are dedicated for just taking data and labeling them. And they, they get paid now on Google, I think, for 1,000 uh, thousand labeled images for $30 or something like, like this. OK? There is the other category that is unsupervised machine learning. So in unsupervised, what do we have? We have the data, but we don't have the output. Of course, this is easier to get because data, I can get it from everywhere. I, I will process the data. So here we have two different categories of problems. In, in, when we have the labels, we can use regression and classification. Okay? And I will explain the difference between both. And when we don't have the data, we use clustering. So imagine that you have several data of, let's say, several images. And you, you want to divide them into clusters. Okay, for example, this data, let's say for data for different cities. Uh, this data corresponds to this city, the other one. Okay, so it's like you're going to find the data corresponding to the cities without having any prior knowledge. Of course, you're going to process the features of the data to make cl clustering, but you don't have a prior knowledge about what is the expected output. Okay, however, in classification and regression, we do know what's the input and what's the output, so our model is going to learn. So, in your opinion, what would provide more accurate results? Okay, of course, supervised is the best approach, but it's not always possible, or it's going to take a lot of time. Usually when you talk about data labeling, you know it's kind of nightmare for if you're going to do this for several months or even a year or something in order to get the data that you need to build your model. 
Yeah, so here you can see some techniques for classification. We use support vector machine, uh, discriminant analysis, naive bias, and nearest neighbor. Uh, nearest neighbor today, I'm going to, to provide an example on it. Okay. Uh, about regression, so there are different techniques as well. Decision trees, neural network. Even neural network can be used for classification. And you have clustering like K-means, C means hierarchical Gaussian mixture, neural network, and different approaches. And we talked about the two categories that is supervised and unsupervised. And very recently, we have also what we call reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning. So for supervised, you predict the next value, OK? It's task driven, because you have the data and you have its corresponding output. So you can do predictions. Here in unsupervised, you will identify clusters. You will not predict because you don't have the ground truth. OK, usually when we predict, I have a ground truth. I have the real data, so I can build on this data and then predict in the future. But if you don't have, you, what you will say, you will define some clusters. And this is used, for example, in data mining. What does it mean, data mining? You have a lot of data, and you want to extract some knowledge from the data that you don't even know in advance. So it's kind of exploration. You are going to explore your data until finding some information out of the data. OK? And reinforcement learning, it's what we call learn from mistakes. What you will do, you want to control something. And basically, this is used in control, like control of drones, like, or control of robots, or self-driving cars. Nowadays, you have self-driving cars. So in the beginning, what you will do with reinforcement learning, let's say you have a car and you have a data set, and you will let the car, of course, in simulation, drive in the beginning, of course, if the model is, is, not, uh, is not correct, it's going to crash, that's for sure. So what we will do, we're going to make a data set of correct driving behavior. Correct driving behavior, and it's going to be several hours of correct driving behavior. And then we are going to provide this correct driving behavior to the algorithm so it will learn. If I am facing this situation, what will be the linear velocity and the angular velocity of the car such that I will not hit an obstacle, for example, right? OK, so it will learn from mistakes. Every time it's going to improve its behavior until at the end, it will be able to do exactly as the correct behavior of driving or controlling or whatever. And this is now very popular approach in control because uh, people in control usually they use theoretical models uh, using mathematics, equation, dynamics. OK, in order to, to, to control. But nowadays, they have discovered that they can do actually much better. It gives more flexibility. You don't have to make assumption on the environment. You don't have to make assumptions on the system, because you will work with real data. And then you will develop a behavior that is very similar to, to the real behavior. And it's used also to, to teach robots. Now you can have some robots, for example, that are able to uh, throw a basketball into the hoop or, for example, play tennis, they learn by doing, let's say, learning by doing, OK, by learning from the mistakes. So these are the th difference between the three categories of machine learning. Now let's talk about supervised learning, OK? So basically, what do we have? Usually, we have some kind of labeled data. And we have some model that, uh, in the beginning, it's random, OK? We will provide this labeled data, train the model with the labeled data. and Finally, we will provide a new model to this. Then we will take uh, unlabeled data and use the trained model to predict the label for the labeled data. OK? So take this one, and you will find some kind of prediction. Of course, now in the testing, or what we call the validation data, what we will do, we will have the output from the model and the ground truth. What does it mean, the ground truth? The real output, for example, if I, if I use the model, it has to return, for example, 1. But in the real data, it's 1.2. So there is a difference of 0.2, OK, and so on. We're going to compare one by one, and we will see the error. We will, we will measure the error between the predicted model and the ground truth model, the real model. If the error is big, what we will have to do? Do, again, the training. So we will do the training until the error will be very low. It can never be 0. If it is 0, you have something wrong, by the way. OK? But it's going to be very, very small. When it is very small, in this case, 
you can test the, uh, your model with some other unseen data and then redo the same process if you don't find your expected output. Yes. So now uh, we talk about classification and regression. We said that these are two techniques used for supervised learning. What is the difference? Basically, they, they are very similar. The difference is that the regression is when you have the, your output numerical. You have a numerical output, something continuous. Okay? And the classification, when you have categorical output, discrete. Let's make an example to understand what is the difference between a numerical output and categorical uh, output. So now, for example, if we say, what is the temperature going to be tomorrow? So the temperature is a value. It's a continuous value. Okay? In this case, we talk about regression. So for example, we can take millions of temperature data over the years, okay? And then we can make some model to predict the temperature of tomorrow, given, for example, the temperature of the previous days. However, for example, if you want to make, will it be cold or hot tomorrow? So we are, we are still dealing with temperature. But now, the output is not a value. It's not numerical. Okay? It's, it's a category. Hot or cold. But if you have images, why we say image, uh, we say image classification and we don't say image regression? Because at the end, an image, you will say, this is a cat, this is a dog. You won't say this is 1.2 or 3.5. No. Okay? So classification is about a categorical data. It's not numeric. It doesn't have a value. It has a category. Okay? This is the difference between regression and classification. Now, if I give you this question, predict the price of houses based on the house's features, surface, location, number of rooms. Is this a classification or a regression? Because the output is a price, and the price is actually a numerical value. So here, we are dealing with a regression problem, okay? not a classification problem. So this is an example, and uh, we will do this in, uh, with a neural network in TensorFlow, but let me introduce the data here. Imagine that you have a data. So our data, we, define, we divide it into what we call features and output. So features um al-khasas, the characteristics. Here we have uh, an ID, we have the date, we have the age, we have the distance, stores, latitude, longitude, and finally the price. Now we want to divide our data into features and output or labels. So let's take one by one. Serial, is this a feature? Uh, it doesn't affect anything, you know, it's just a serial number. You can make A, B, C, you can make one, two, three. It's not a characteristic. So that's why we will exclude it from the feature. So now when you provide your input, in your data you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fields, but one of them is not relevant. So we need to prune the data and removing everything that is not relevant. Otherwise, it's going to disturb. Why, if, if I give zero here, what does it mean? You know, it doesn't, mean, doesn't have any impact on the value of the price. It is just a way to organize the data with certain index. However, the date is something that impacts the cost or the price. The age also, okay? And the distance, the store, and the location as well. So here, we will keep as features. That's why in the beginning of a machine learning, the first step to do is what we call feature extraction. Feature extraction is the process of extracting the input data that is most relevant. You know, this is a very simple example, but sometimes you can have thousands of data. And some of them might be redundant. Some of them might not be relevant. Okay, so the first question you ask yourself, what is the number of features that are relevant for my problem? And there are some specific algorithms that helps you to select some specific features among what you have. Okay, and this can be done manually or can be done automatically. Okay, and the good thing, so for example, you will see later that with machine learning, feature extraction is done manually, usually. And with deep learning, algorithms actually is, are going to find the features automatically. And you will see how, we, how this is done. And finally, you have your output here. 
okay, which are called also labels. And then the objective is to find a model that will be able to predict the house price. For example, here in our case, we have 5,000 values. Okay, it will help to build some kind of realistic model for uh, the prices. So now, if we have this question, determine if an image contains a fire. Is this a classification or regression? The output is fire or not fire. Okay, so it's category here. We don't have number. We have discrete values. It can be zero and one, even if it is a value zero and one, fire or not fire, but it's not something continuous. Okay, so yes, here, here it is classification. Problem. So now for unsupervised learning, the approach is completely different. Okay, so usually in classification, when you have, uh, when you know the input and the output, you are able actually to draw a boundary between the data. So you say, this is red, this is green. But with unsupervised, you don't have any output information. So we'll try to make cluster. So here you can make some algorithms that actually to make cluster around the points that are very similar to each other. And of course, there are some parameters or hyperparameters that will affect the cluster, okay, the clustering performance. Okay, for example, this one was classified as green, but if we increase a little bit, it can be classified as red. Now it depends on your clustering technique. So we usually in unsupervised learning, we input the raw data. So the, the, the output is unknown and we don't, we don't have any training data set. And finally, we process the data through a learning algorithm. You make processing and you will find different clusters for the output. Okay, so this slide shows the difference between machine learning and deep learning, as already mentioned. And here in machine learning, the feature extraction, it means the data that will help to identify the output is done manually, okay, outside the machine learning algorithm. And then when we find the features, like we did, for example, for the small house pricing example, we will provide the features into our neural network. And finally, you will estimate the output. Now in deep learning, it's more sophisticated. We will provide the raw data. Because now here, for example, I will have an input as an image. It has a lot of pixels. But these pixels, actually, some parts are more useful than others. For example, the boundaries the edges. Now, if I give you just the edges of an image, you will be able to say whether this is a car, whether this is a cat, whether this is a dog, just by the edges. And now the edges contains much less points than the whole image. So feature extraction is basically, it's about dimensionality reduction. We reduce the dimensionality of the data because you, you might have thousands of data or millions of data, but not all of them is useful or not all of them is relevant. So we need to find a way to reduce the data what is the benefit of reducing the data? Faster. Yeah, because if you put more data, you're going to spend more time in processing. So we want to remove the data without losing precision. And this is very critical part in machine learning projects. Okay? So in deep learning models, the feature extraction is now embedded into the uh, neural network itself. Okay? So there are some layers that are dedicated for feature extraction. For example, for convolution neural network, convolution helps to reduce the dimensionality of the image, okay? And the filters, some filters will detect the edges, vertical edges, horizontal edges, and so on. And then based on some combinations, it's going to go through classification, simple classification, and finally provide the expected output, okay? So later on with the example, when we do convolution neural network and more advanced neural network, you will see actually this one. But now, for example, we can understand the example of manual feature extraction in the previous example of House, house pricing or the prediction of house prices. Okay, we had to remove, for example, the ID, the serial, because it's not relevant. We did this manually. And then we kept only six among seven features and we will provide them into the classification neural network to find the expected output. Okay, so now why deep learning models are taking off, are raising more than traditional pre uh, machine learning models? Maybe. 15 years ago, most of the people are talking about super vector machine or k-means clustering or these traditional machine learning techniques. At that time, deep learning was not very popular. Neural network was old, as it was from the maybe 80s or 90s, but it didn't actually prove itself as compared to other machine learning techniques. 
Why? There are several reasons. So at that time, first of all, as already explained in the previous lecture, we didn't have enough processing power. That's one of the issues. And the second problem is also the size of the data was, was very small as compared of nowadays. So nowadays we have much, for example, higher uh, high resolution images. We have much more images than before. We have much more databases. So that's why the number of training data have increased a lot. Okay, and for example, in the case of ImageNet, we have 14 million images. It's huge. Okay, so the deep learning performance basically it increases a lot when you you increase the size of the data sets of the training images, and this is why nowadays we have so deep learning are much more popular than traditional machine learning approaches. It's because also the training data size has increased a lot. And even within deep learning, so the performance will depend on the data. Okay, so neural network can be with varying depth. I will introduce neural network, but usually they are composed of several layers. You can have three layers, you can have 100 layer, 200 layers. It depends on how much layer you want. So for the large neural network, their performance is better than shallow neural network with small layers only when the data is very high. However, if you use large neural network and the data that you have is small, so the performance is going to be even poorer than deeper neural network. Okay? So even the neural network itself, it has different size. Okay? And the performance of deep neural network are better than shallow, what you call deep and shallow. Shallow, for example, two, three layers, four layers, not that deep. If we go, for example, very deep, 100 layer, so in this case, we will need to define, uh, we will need to have a very large data set. Okay, because every neuron is going to have some kind of weights. So if you have millions of weights, and sometimes billions of weights, and you have only small data, so it, it's not going sufficient to, to adapt all these weights to their correct values. Okay, so in this case, you have to reduce a little bit. So there is no actually rule that tells you you have to make this exact number, but you have to try different architectures. And of course, you can take this graph into account to know what would be the depth or the, for your neural network architecture that matches the size of your, uh, of your data. So in this video, I will show you an example of k-mean clustering. You can see in the beginning we have uh, data. So they, they will, uh, first of all, we identify the centroid of the data, and then it's like a coloring process, a coloring process such that we define different clusters for the data. So this is completely unsupervised. We don't have any ground truth. There is going to be a kind of exploration of the data to minimize some kind of error, the distance between the centroid and the all surrounding data such that, for example, if you are closer to the centroid, you're going to belong to a certain class. So if you change the centroid uh, position, the, uh, the clustering result is going to change as well. Of course, there are different hyperparameters uh, that will impact the, uh, the performance of the k-means clustering. So in the second part of this uh, lecture, I'm going to talk about the problem of image classification. Okay, so I will introduce the different challenges uh, about image classification to give you some intuition about this. We're not going to talk about the math and uh, the theoretical background, but just an overview about image classification. And in the next lecture, we'll start working a little bit on neural network on how we can deal this with neural network. So let's get started. The problem of image classification, as I have introduced in part one, is that we have an image, and then we're going to uh, output a label. And this is a categorical data, not a numerical data, so that's why we talk about classification. So we can have different labels, like dog, cat, horse, or lion, and then based on uh, an image as an input, and a model, a trained model, the trained model should be able to provide with certain accuracy and precision about the, the correct label of the image. Now, of course, the problem in itself is very challenging 
because first of all, we have already introduced that an image is just a, a matrix of numbers, and it's quite hard to uh, infer from these numbers what, what's actually the content of the image. So the computer is going to observe these numbers, and we need to find some models in order to be able to uh, define or specify what is the content of the image. And among the challenges is the angle of view. Now we can have a cat from this perspective and also you can have a fr front perspective, you can have from the top, from the background. And of course, if you change even one degree or you change anything, all these numbers are going to change, will be completely different, okay? So they will change from uh, numbers. If you change also the illumination, so there are different parameters that will affect the image itself and it will make even harder for the algorithm or the model to classify it correctly. So let's talk about the different challenges. Uh, we have the problem of illumination. So all of these different images are for cats. Some are dark, some are very illuminated. And even if you take one image, you change the illumination, the value of the pixel is going to change as well. Okay and it will look like as a different image from the numbers, but in reality it is the same from human eyes perspective. So this is an important challenge to take it into account. We can have deformations. So all these different images are for cats, but they appear in different ways. Okay, now if you say I'm going to make a edge, the edges here will be completely different. They will not like the skeleton of the cat as it is in the normal position. You can have occlusions. Okay, so for you it's very easy to, to understand that there is a cat here, but for a computer it's, it's pretty much difficult because he's going to, uh, he, there is a lot of noise. The grass here is represent the noise that occludes big part of the uh, cat. And even here, you know, the cat you have only the, the tail of the cat, so it, it's really very difficult. Here it's also occluded, you have only the head. We can have also background clutter. So two different backgrounds will affect also the content of the image. And we can have variation between the class. So different cats will have different appearances, will have different colors, okay? And all these, all these different uh, uh, challenges make the problem of image classification a quite hard problem. So the idea here, in order to overcome these problems, what we should do usually? Now imagine that, of course, we have built some kind of model. What we should do in order that the model will provide us an accurate uh, classification output, okay? Given all these different challenges and variations possible, what we should do? We give a large number of data. Okay, yes, th this is one point, but also how, what about the variety of data? Yeah, for example, I can give you one cut, and then I will make this cut uh, with different uh, colors using, for example, some Photoshop or something, is this sufficient? And they will produce one million image from one cut instance. Is this sufficient? No. Okay, so what do we need to have? We need to have also a variety of cut pictures and the different deformations, different eliminations, different occlusion models, okay? So that the model is trained to know that there is a cut object in all these different circumstances, okay? If, for example, you're going to provide a very large data set, but you will not provide any data set that contains occlusions. So your model is going to fail completely if you provide any of these images, okay? Or if you provide only for dark images, if you provide illuminated images, it's going to fail as well, or likely to, it will fail. So you need to consider all the different possible situations, okay, for a cut in order for your model to be, be accurate and precise. As already introduced in the previous part of this lecture, the classical programming approach is try to develop some uh, static methods, okay? It, and it takes an image as an input and try to return a label as output. But this actually is very hard and it doesn't work, obviously. Okay, for example, one of the possible ways is try to make some image processing techniques in order to extract the edges. And then you can try to find some computation models in order to check the orientation of edges and based on this you, you try to make some inference. But it's very difficult because as you have seen we can have deformations, we can have occlusions, so these edges you are not sure that you are going to have the same type of edges every time. So 
classical computer vision techniques may not work probably in this, uh, for this problem. The data-driven approach that we have introduced, it's based on having a data set and labels. Okay, and again, this is supervised learning. We will have a train function or a train method and the predict method. The train method is going to take two information in supervised learning. We have introduced already these concepts, the images and the labels. And the predict uh, model is going to take the model and then a test images in order to, have to predict the labels. Okay, so first of all, we need to collect data set of images and labels. Then we use a machine learning technique to train the classifier. And finally, we evaluate the classifier using new test images. Okay, now I'm going to introduce the most naive and basic solution to this problem, which we call the nearest neighbor. So what does the nearest neighbor? It will also define a train model and uh, a train method and the predict method. So the train method is going just to memorize all the data and labels, nothing more. Take all your images, put them in the memory. Okay, and then in the predict model, what we will do, we will take, for example, one test image, and we will try to find what is the closest image to this test image by comparing pixel by pixel. Okay, the, we try to uh, compute the distance between two images, and the smallest distance will be the selected image. So what's the idea here? So if we take the example of CIFAR 10 data set that we have introduced before, we have 50,000 training images and 10,000 testing images. So what we will do, we will put all these 50,000 images into the memory, put them into some data structure and they are there. Okay, that's the training phase. Actually, we did not do any training, but just saving all the images into the memory. And then we have 10,000 images that we will use for testing. And these are the 10 categories here. And then, for example, if you take one image from the testing, what you will do, you're going to compare with all the 50,000 images. You'll compare pixel-wise, pixel by pixel. This first pixel minus first pixel, second pixel minus second pixel. And you try to estimate the distance between the two different images. One of the ways is actually to calculate the L1 distance which is just the Euclidean distance, uh, it's uh, the distance between the pixels, difference between pixel in image one and the pixel in image two. So for example here, 56 minus 10, it will be 46. And then 32 minus 20, it will be 12. And then what you will do, you will make the absolute difference, you will add all these together, and you will find a number. You'll calculate the number, a distance for the first, with the first training image, second training image, third training image, 50,000 images, you make the, the comparison. And then you will select the image that has the lowest distance. Okay, so the, this is the idea here, is to find uh, the closest image to uh, everyone based on the difference between the pixels. Uh, this is an example here of uh, Python code which you can find in this book, Deep Learning for Computer Vision. We have a copy, we have a copy here. Uh, it's a very nice book. It has three volumes, one for starters and then two other for advanced. So the train here, what does it do? It will define two uh, attributes of the class. So here we have a class in Python and we will assign X and Y. X are the images and Y are the labels. And then what we will do, it will make the prediction for every image in, uh, in the test images, in the, in the training images, you will calculate the distance between the images and then find the index of the minimum distance, arg mean distances. So here you have a list of distances or an array of distances. You will determine the index of this distance here and then your predicted label will be just the, the index. But as you have already inferred this, inferred, this technique is not very efficient. Here, uh, this is the phase to memorize all the data and labels. And here, you will try to find the closest training label based on the distance computation. So the question is, how fast uh, is this classifier if we test n images? So the answer here for the training is going to only have uh, o of 1, you know the complexity of algorithms. 
okay? Because it's only one time we, we copy into the memory. But for every image, for every test image, we will have to make n comparison. So it's O n. So it's very bad performance in terms of real time. It's not good because we want completely the opposite. We want the classifier is fast for prediction and not problem it is slow in training. So the nearest neighbor classifier, it is a classifier that allows to find uh, the boundary of uh, the different points. Okay, so here it is supervised learning. So you can see here we have a problem that this point is inside the green, okay? Because there are some hyperparameters that will affect the result. And we can see now we can have different behavior of uh, the clustering here in the k nearest behavior if we change the k. So this one, k equal to 1. What does it mean? We're going to compare the distance with only one point. Okay, and here we have k equal to 3. So you can see the clustering is going to be different. And for k equal to 5, it's going to be different as well. So k here is, is kind of hyperparameter that will affect the performance of the training. Okay, it's called hyperparameter. We'll talk about hyperparameters. It's a characteristic of machine learning algorithms. And if you change it, the result is going to change. So of course, when you increase the k, in this case, this, this point okay, will be included in green, although it is uh, yellow. So it's kind of an outlier, but at least you have a consistent boundary for, for the green here. Okay? So because here, why we did this boundary as uh, yellow? Because there is a yellow point. And look, all this region okay, is closer to the yellow. So how do we make the coloring here? We will take every point, and we will color the region with the color of the point okay, that is closest to it. At this point here, it's the boundary. Now, if we go here, it's closer to this one. Okay? But if you, when you increase the k, the condition you need to have three points okay, to get a color that is yellow. And here you need to have five points in order to have the region as yellow or green or whatever. For Canon, there are different uh, distant metrics. We talked about the L1 distance, which we call Manhattan distance. OK, the comparison pixel-wise. And also, you have the Euclidean distance. It's not, it's, it is not just the simple difference, but it's the square root of the sum of the squares, the, difference, the square of the differences between the different points. Of course, if you change any of this, you will have different performance. And we cannot say that this technique is better than the other or the, the opposite. It's based on the problem. So you, you can try. And whenever you are satisfied with the solution, so you can take it. But it doesn't mean it can generalize to every type of problem. So you can see here the clustering with the Euclidean distance and the clustering with the Manhattan distance. <coughs> Look, we can observe that the boundaries with Euclidean distance are smoother, okay, as compared to Manhattan distance. They are smoother because we take the square root of the square of the difference. So there is a demo here. You can actually try it at home. It's uh, from Stanford University, from the course that I have already pointed to you. And you can play with the value of neighbors, play with the value of points, the number of classes, and the metrics, and you will see different behavior for the clustering here. So I invite you to, to test this at home so you can get an information about the impact of the hyperparameter. So now I'm going to talk about the hyperparameter. K is a hyperparameter, and we have to differentiate between a parameter and the hyperparameter of, uh, of a machine learning model. So in machine learning, a hyperparameter is a parameter whose value is set before the learning process begins. So usually in machine learning, we have two types of parameters. The parameter of the machine learning and the hyperparameter of the machine learning model. Hyperparameters are values that you try to set. For example, here, the value of k. It's a hyperparameter. However, the parameters are those that your model is going to learn. 
during the training phase. Okay? So for example, neural network, it contains several weights, what we call W and B. So these W and Bs are called parameters. They are called parameters. Why? In the beginning, they will be random because I don't know their correct value. And they will, be, they will learn from the data, from the input I'm going to provide to the model. So they are going to adjust, to self-adjust until the error is minimized. This, we call them parameter. Hyperparameter is outside of the model, but it has an impact on the model. OK? It's a parameter that you set yourself in advance. For example, in the context of neural network, we have what we call learning rate. We will see this in detail later, OK? And some other hyperparameters. And these values will have an impact on the training but are not part of the model, the training model. The parameters in the other side are the ones of the model used to make prediction. For example, K is not used to make prediction, but it is used to develop the model. Okay, in Kynan, there are two hyperparameters, K and the distance. So the distance can be Manhattan or can be a Euclidean distance. And the K can be a number one, two, three, four, five. You can choose it. OK, so these values doesn't make part of the, uh, the model, but they have an impact on the final result. OK, so the hyperparameter are a very problem dependent. There is no systematic way to say this is the best. I cannot say that Manhattan distance is always better than Euclidean distance, or the Euclidean distance is always better than the Manhattan distance. No. Basically, it's a problem dependent. You have to try. You have to check, observe your errors. If you are satisfied, it's OK. If you are not satisfied, in this case, you do again with different uh, hyperparameter values. OK? And try all of them and check what works best. So for example, now we have also different projects that are running. We usually make the neural network for one hyperparameter, then for a second one, for a third one. And then we compile everything, and we see which one actually is producing the best result. OK? And if we have another data set, it doesn't mean that the results that you have obtained with the first one are valid for the second. We have to redo again the same process. So machine learning is basically try, observe, and retry again until you are satisfied with your solution. OK, so for setting the hyper the first idea is to choose the hyperparameter that work best on the data. What you will do, you take all your data set and you use it for training. OK, k equal 1 always work perfectly on this data because you will use the full data set for training. But this is not a good approach because if you use the whole data set for training, you don't have any other data to validate to tell whether it's, uh, whether your model uh, is going to be uh, fine or efficient for other type of data that is unseen. So another way is to split the data into a train and test. OK, choose the hyperparameters that work best on train and test data. So you will run your model. Then you will make it on test. And finally, you, uh, you will check whether the error in test is also small, like the error in training. This idea is not also very good because no idea how algorithm will perform on even new data. OK? You have divided your, your data set into training and testing. For this hyperparameter, it worked. But imagine that you will have other type of data that you haven't seen before. So it's not sufficient. OK? So what's the best practice is actually to have three types of data. And now what we will do, so what, when we say hyperparameter tuning or setting, OK, I will make train and test. If it is not good, I'm going to change until I'm satisfied. OK, but in this case, you are not sure whether this can be generalized. So what we will do here, in the case of train and validation testing, we will train our model on the, uh, with the hyperparameters. Then we will try to test it on the validation model. If we are satisfied, OK, if we are not satisfied, we are going to check with another hyperparameter. And we keep trying until we are satisfied by applying training 
to train and validation to verify. Whenever we are satisfied, what we will do, we will bring another data that hasn't been seen before, not the validation, not the training, it's called the test data, and I will apply it on the last model for which I am happy with the hyperparameters. Okay, so in this case, I can have a better setting. If your hyperparameters work very fine on validation, train, and testing, it means, okay, you have something that is close to be general. Okay, only two data sets might not be efficient to say that I have a general performance of uh, the algorithm. Now, for example, you have, let's say, 60,000. You will take, uh, for example, uh, 40,000 for training, 10,000 for validation, and 10,000 for testing. Okay, so first of all, I will build my model. I will take 40,000, put them into the model, it, he will it will learn, and then I will have one model with this hyperparameter. I will bring my validation data. I will test it, check the error of validation, what we call validation error. If the validation error is high, so my model is not general, because usually what we want to do, we want to have error that is low. مثلاً, it is a cat who equal dog, مثلاً, على new data. For, let's say, 70% of time, it's correct, and 30% is incorrect. So I can say that 30% still high error. So what I will do, I will change the hyperparameter another time. We change the hyperparameter, we make the training, and then we make the validation again. Let's assume now the validation error, 25%. It increased but a little bit. I will make a third iteration. I change the hyperparameter, maybe increasing or decreasing, okay? And then I will make on the validation test, third time. Now it becomes 10%. Oh, now it's, it starts to be better. Let me try a fourth iteration. I will try to increase, decrease, okay, let's, I and the validation reaches 95% of accuracy. Now I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied, that's fine, okay. Let me try now this model on the test data. I haven't used it before. It's completely new. I found with the test data, 70%. I cannot try, I cannot trust the model too much because it was optimized with respect to the train and validation. If, for example, when you try with the test data, you find 93%, 95%, something close to the validation, in this case, you can say, my model is almost general because it works fine on validation and seen first unseen data and it works also fine on another unseen data so it's likely if i provide some other new images it's likely is going to give me some correct prediction okay so this is why the models are much better evaluated if you decompose them into train validation and testing maybe this process is iterative you can do it even 10 times with validation until you are happy. And when it comes to testing, you don't know. So usually the testing is the last thing. When you are really fully happy with your model, perform very well on different validation tests, and then you go for your testing in this case. This is the best approach on how to proceed. Some other approach is called the cross-validation, which is now the standard approach for splitting the data and producing general results, is that we can decompose the data into five parts or chunks. And one time we use, for example, fold one to four for training, fold five for validation, and this one for testing. And then we will make another training and we will change the validation to four instead of five. Use five for training, we'll four in the validation. And we keep this for one for testing. And then we can use one, two, four, five for training and three for validation. So we give different possibilities. The annual N, your training is going to be dependent. If you always use the training one to four, so your model is going to be very focused on the training data used. But every time if you change the training data, you're going to change your resulting model. So you will evaluate among all of this, which model is more general than the other, okay? Can be generalized more than the other by every time changing the training set and the validation set. This is what we call cross-validation splitting the data into folds, and then try each fold as validation and average the result. And uh, the line goes through the mean bar. And here we can see that how to make cross-validation. This is K, the hyperparameter, and these are cross-validation accuracy. Okay, so the best accuracy we reach it is 31%. For which value? For the value 7 of K. So here we can say that K is the best hyperparameter setting for this particular type of data.